Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Metz. I'm the Chief of Medicine at the Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Today, we're going to discuss cancer and cancer prevention. As many of you may already know, heart disease and heart-related events remain the leading cause of death in the United States. All causes of cancer combined are the second leading cause of death, followed by chronic lung disease, injuries, and stroke. Heart disease has decreased significantly over the last 40 years, while cancer has only decreased slightly. The narrowing of this gap is due in large part to advances in emergency response times, improved access to cardiac cath labs, and advances in pharmacologic therapy. The cancer treatment landscape has also dramatically changed over the last 40 years, with advancements in surgery, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy. Meanwhile, advances in genomic analysis, targeted therapies, and immunotherapy are allowing us to tailor treatment to specific types of cancer. There were approximately 1.7 million new cases of cancer diagnosed last year in the United States. There are many types of cancer, with prostate, breast, lung, colorectal, and skin cancer being among the most common. Cancer is not just one disease. Rather, it's a collection of many diseases. To better understand cancer, let's first review the miracle that is the human body. Consider that there are over 37 trillion cells in the human body. Each cell normally contains 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46. The result is 3 billion base pairs of DNA tightly coiled up inside each cell, making up the human genome. If you were to uncoil this DNA, you would find this long, double-stranded helix. The distance between the Earth and the Sun is 92.96 million miles. If you were to line all of the DNA found in every cell of a human body, it would stretch from the Earth to the Sun 100 times. So what is cancer? As we discussed earlier, cancer is a collection of many diseases. Most share three key traits. First, remember that our bodies are made up of trillions of cells. Each cell has its own nucleus, or center, that contains identical copies of DNA. Normally, these cells grow and divide to form new cells as our bodies need them. When cells become old or damaged, they die off and new cells arise to take their place, and balance is maintained. When cancer develops, this balance is disrupted. Instead of being replaced, old or damaged cells survive. These cells then rapidly divide without stopping and may form growths called tumors. The first trait of cancer is that cancer cells grow more quickly and live longer than normal cells. Second, cancer cells can form into a mass called the primary tumor and grow through the outer parts of an organ or structure and into other tissues. Third, Cancer cells can leave the tissue in which they started and spread to other sites of the body through the blood and lymphatic system. So cancer is really a word or a term for diseases in which abnormal cells divide without control and can invade nearby tissues. Now that we understand abnormal cell growth from individual cells leads to cancer, we can look at the different stages of cancer. Stage zero describes cancer in situ, which means in place. Stage zero cancers are still located in the original place they started and have not spread to nearby tissues. Stage one is usually a small cancer or tumor that has not grown deeply into nearby tissues. It also is not spread to the lymph nodes or other parts of the body and is often called early stage cancer. Stage two and stage three refer to larger cancers or tumors that have grown more deeply into the nearby tissue. They may have also spread to local lymph nodes, but not to outer parts of the body. Stage four means that the cancer has spread to other organs or parts of the body. It may also be called advanced or metastatic cancer. For example, a patient with stage four breast cancer may have cancer dividing in certain areas of the breast that then spread into the lymphatic system in the axillary area, and then more distally to the lung. The Human Genome Project was an international scientific research project spanning 13 years from 1990 to 2003, with the goal of mapping all genes of the human genome. This was a monumental scientific achievement because we can use information from DNA to develop new ways to treat or even prevent the thousands of diseases that afflict humankind. 
The data that has emerged since 2003 has changed the way cancer is researched, understood, and treated. Targeted therapy is a special type of chemotherapy that uses drugs or other substances to more precisely attack cancer cells. Targeted therapy can prevent, block, and interrupt cell growth. It can also cut off blood flow to the tumor, target defects in the cancer cells, carry other drugs to a tumor, cause cell death, and make cancer cells more receptive to the immune system. One example of targeted therapy is the human epidermal growth factor receptor 2 protein known as HER2. HER2 is expressed at high levels on the surface of some cancer cells. Several targeted therapies are directed against HER2, including trastuzumab, which is approved to treat certain breast and stomach cancers that overexpress HER2. Immunology and oncology have been linked since the late 19th century, when the surgeon William Cooley reported that an injection of killed bacteria into sites of sarcoma could lead to tumor shrinkage. Immunotherapy is treatment that uses certain parts of our own immune system to fight cancer. Immunotherapy drugs can block tumor cells from deactivating T cells, allowing our T cells to continue fighting cancer cells. We've talked about what cancer is, the stages of cancer, and some of the newer cancer treatments. But why do people develop cancer? Well, we have different genes affecting our risk of precancerous tissue damage and our ability to repair tissue damage. We also have different lifestyles and life exposures. As we discussed earlier, old or damaged cells that survive can become cancerous cells. This follows years of tissue and cell damage from smoking, dietary habits and obesity, sunlight exposure, excessive alcohol consumption, viruses, and occupational factors. That tissue damage is often silent, causing no symptoms. Several cancers are directly associated with obesity and being overweight, including cancers of the breast, colon, pancreas, esophagus, ovaries, uterus, multiple myeloma, and liver. Lifestyle can also cause precancerous tissue damage. This includes any form of tobacco, such as cigarettes. Tobacco causes many other types of cancer beyond lung cancer, including cancers of the throat, mouth, nasal cavity, esophagus, stomach, pancreas, kidney, bladder, cervix, and blood. In fact, smoking is directly responsible for 90% of lung cancer deaths. 53,000 Americans will be diagnosed with oral cancer this year, with over 9,750 deaths, and only slightly more than half, or 57%, will be alive in five years, as the cancer is routinely discovered late in its development. Most people with oral cavity and oral pharyngeal cancers use tobacco, and the risk of developing these cancers is related to how much and how long they smoked or chewed. Seven out of 10 patients with oral cancers are heavy drinkers. Sun exposure is another risk factor related to lifestyle, and sunburn is a clear sign that the DNA in your skin cells has been damaged by too much UV radiation. Getting sunburn just once every two years can triple your risk of melanoma skin cancer. Sunburn doesn't have to be raw, peeling, or blistering. If your skin has gone pink or red in the sun, it's sunburn. How can you protect yourself from cancer? Learning to be sun smart can reduce your risk of skin cancer. Spend time in the shade between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. when UV radiation is highest, and when able, use the morning or evening sun periods for your entertainment and outdoor activities. Make sure to never burn. Aim to cover up with a t-shirt, hat, and sunglasses. Remember to take extra care with children then use 30 plus SPF. There are many free apps that help monitor UV exposure. Dietary habits are another component of lifestyle that impact precancerous tissue damage by affecting the lining of the large bowel, particularly with fried, fast, and fatty foods. Diets high in carbohydrates, sweets, and starches also increase your risk for precancer tissue damage. A diet rich in fruits and vegetables can decrease precancerous tissue damage. Minimize sugars and sweets. 
Avoid fried, fast, and fatty foods. And look to lean meats, such as fish and chicken, in place of red meat. Lifestyle includes behaviors and activities within our control. But as we discussed earlier, our genetic makeup, our DNA, is beyond our control. Do you have an increased risk of developing cancer? Look at your family history for clues, as these clues can save your life. Who has cancer? What type of cancer? What age diagnosis? It really is detective work. For instance, multiple family members affected by the same type of cancer in different generations. This is information to share with your primary care provider. So protect yourself from cancer, learn your family medical history, and get regular physical checkups with your doctor, including appropriate screening tests for your age and cancer risk. Be aware of the warning signs of cancer and discuss these with your primary care provider. There are seven major warning signs of cancer emphasized by the letters of the word caution. Change in bowel or bladder habits, a sore that will not heal, unusual bleeding or discharge, thickening or lump in the breast or elsewhere, indigestion or difficulty swallowing, obvious change in a wart or mole, nagging cough or persistent hoarseness. Early detection greatly increases the chances for successful treatment. Screening refers to the use of simple tests across a healthy population in order to identify individuals who have disease, but do not yet have symptoms. Screening allows us to identify precancerous tissue and capture cancer at the earliest possible stage. When treatment is simpler, screening is available for prostate, breast, colorectal, cervical, lung, skin, and head and neck cancer. There is no current approved reliable screening mechanism for pancreatic cancer or ovarian cancer. Prostate cancer is the number one cancer risk for men and the number two cancer killer behind lung cancer. One in nine men develop prostate cancer. We will see roughly 174,000 new cases with over 31,000 deaths in the United States each year. Prostate cancer is twice as likely with an immediate blood relative, such as a father or a brother. There is a 70% higher risk for prostate cancer in African-American men. There is increased risk with diets that are high in saturated fat. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network recommends annual screenings at age 50 for average risk and age 40 for high-risk men. Screening can be performed with a simple blood test referred to as the PSA or prostate-specific antigen. Breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer worldwide, affecting women of all races. One in eight women will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. Each year in the United States, there will be almost 63,000 new cases of non-invasive breast cancer and over 268,000 new cases of invasive breast cancer with over 40,000 deaths. The five-year survival rate for breast cancer has improved from 63% in the 1960s to 89% today, due in large part to screening programs and advances in treatment. 75% of women with breast cancer do not have a family history, and less than 10% have a genetic mutation. Most patients present due to an abnormal mammogram. However, up to 15% of women are diagnosed with breast cancer due to the presence of a breast mass that's not detected on mammogram, and another 30% present with a breast mass during the interval between mammograms. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network recommends annual screening begin at age 40. Higher risk populations, such as BRCA1, BRCA2, or prior treatment with radiation to the chest wall, may begin screening earlier, so discuss with your primary care provider. In most cases, lumpectomy plus radiation is equally effective to mastectomy. Chemotherapy is not always indicated. Early detection is key. The future is bright as over 3 million women have survived breast cancer and there's a 98% survival rate with early detection versus a 27% survival rate in advanced stage. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer-related death among men and women. There are approximately 1.8 million patients worldwide yearly with an estimated 1.6 million deaths. 
There are over 234,000 patients in the United States with over 154,000 deaths annually. Unfortunately, the five-year survival rate is roughly 10 to 15% as most lung cancers are advanced at the time of diagnosis. Only 15% of cases are identified in an early stage, but the survival rate is as high as 54% in these patients. The primary risk factor for lung cancer is cigarette smoking and is responsible for approximately 90% of cases of lung cancer. The risk of developing lung cancer in a current pack-a-day smoker for 40 years is approximately 20 times higher than that of someone who has never smoked. Unfortunately, the smoking rate in the United States remains high at about 15%. For individuals who do quit smoking, the risk of developing lung cancer falls compared with those who continue to smoke. Environmental factors are also associated with an increased risk for developing lung cancer, including exposure to secondhand smoke, asbestos, radon, metals, ionizing radiation, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons such as tar and coal. Dietary factors, including antioxidants, cruciferous vegetables, phytoestrogens, may reduce the risk of lung cancer, but the role of these factors is still not well established. Mortality may be lowered up to 20% by screening high-risk individuals with CT scan. This includes those aged 55 to 74 years with a smoking history equivalent to a pack a day for 30 years and currently smoke or have quit within the last 15 years. Colon cancer is the third most commonly diagnosed cancer and second leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States. There are approximately 1.8 million cases of colon cancer each year and about 861,000 deaths worldwide. Approximately 50,630 Americans die of colorectal cancer annually, accounting for about 8% of all cancer-related deaths. 86% of those diagnosed under the age of 50 are symptomatic at diagnosis, and this is associated with more advanced stage at diagnosis and poorer outcomes. African Americans have the highest colorectal cancer rate of all ethnic groups in the United States with a 20% higher mortality than Caucasians. Diabetes, cigarette smoking, and excessive alcohol use are associated with elevated risk. Regular physical activity is associated with protection from colorectal cancer. There are many options for colon cancer screening, including guaiac-based fecal occult blood tests, fecal immunohistochemical tests, fecal immunohistochemical test DNA, CT colonography, flexible sigmoidoscopy with fecal immunohistochemical test, and colonoscopy, which remains the gold standard. Some of these can be performed in your own home, while some require anesthesia and are performed in an endoscopy center. Given how many options there are for screening, we recommend you discuss with your primary care provider which screening option is best for you. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network recommends initial screening at age 50 for average risk patients. The world of cancer is a vast collection of many diseases, and over the past 45 years has significantly closed the gap between heart disease as the leading cause of death in the United States. 1.7 million new cases of cancer are diagnosed annually in the United States, led by breast, prostate, lung, and colon cancer. Healthy lifestyle focusing on diet, exercise, weight control, tobacco cessation, and limiting alcohol consumption can decrease the risk of cancer. Early detection dramatically improves survival rates. Screening options include pap smear, starting at age 21 for cervical cancer, mammogram starting at age 40 for breast cancer, prostate-specific antigens starting at age 40 or 50 for prostate cancer, colonoscopy starting at age 50 for colorectal cancer, and CT in high-risk populations for lung cancer. Multiple modalities exist to treat cancer, including surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and combinations of these, as well as targeted therapy, giving us optimism for the future. Discuss your risks and screening with your primary care provider. Thank you for joining me today. I hope this presentation opened your eyes to what cancer is and what types of screening options that we have. 
And I hope it motivates you to have the conversation with your primary care doctor about what types of screening are good for you. For more information, visit cancercenter.com.